my recording. Yes. Okay, well, hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Destiny Dunbar, and I am the Community Engagement Specialist for Resources. And again, thank you for joining us for our North Sound Stewards Speaker Series. For those of you who don't know about North Sound Stewards or may not be a steward yourself, um, it's a joint program between the Whatcom Marine Re Whatcom Marine Resources Committee and Resources, and together we get together and train volunteers to be um, community scientists and gather data on the health of our waterways. So these speaker series are a way to educate our stewards and the community as well. This is open to everybody. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to do something a little different than we usually do just because we have such a small group. I'm going to invite you all to turn on your cameras and just introduce yourself super quick. You can just say, your name and why you're tuning in or something that you hope to learn today so i will go ahead and just i'll just call on folks i'm going to pick on eleanor because she's my coworker. so <laughs> um hi i'm eleanor hines i um work at resources but i always love learning from our sustainable schools program um so i'm really excited to see sasha um present today and I'm sorry if there was something else I was supposed to say. I hate going first because I immediately oh, no. forget. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. Just your name and honestly anything, just what you're excited to learn about or why you wanted to join the webinar. Um, so I'll go ahead and call on Maggie. Yeah, I guess I'm unmuted. Uh, I wasn't, I just came back from a walk. <laughs> wasn't ready to be on video. Um, my name's Maggie, and we've been um, resources fans and supporters for quite some time. Nice, thank you. Okay, and Amanda. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Amanda Hubick. I work with uh, Representative Alex Trammell out here in the 40th, and anything having to do with um, sustainable consumerism is just like a huge personal interest of mine. So I'm really interested to listen and be a part of this and see how um, all of it and any of it can translate over into the work that he does on a state level. Awesome, thank you for joining us, Amanda. Um, and let's hear from Liz. Hey y'all, my name is Liz Scottman. I work with Surfrider Foundation and similar to what Maggie just said, um, it just there's a lot of overlaps between consumerism and all the environmental issues we face. And I'm always looking for new information to either share with my chapter leaders and volunteers or just better my own personal choices. So I love it. And I'm gonna, my battery's dying, so I'm gonna take my video off, but oh, I good, am super good. stoked to be here. <laughs> all right, thank you, Liz and Fritz. Yeah, I'm Fritz, and I'm just interested. Uh, I want to be surprised. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Well, I hope you are. Thank you all for doing that with me. It's so nice to see people's faces, even over Zoom. So I was like, we have a small enough group. Um, but as you may have caught from Eleanor, we're going to be hearing from our very own resources, very own Sasha Savoyan. <laughs> she is a part of our Sustainable Schools program, and she's going to be giving us a presentation on um, consumerism and telling us how we can shift our patterns of spending to support more regenerative, regenerative and just communities and give us some consumer, consumer habit tips. So I'm going to turn off my video here. I'm going to go ahead and read her bio and then I will pass it off. So Sasha joined the Sustainable Schools team as an education specialist in 2017 with a passion for engaging middle and high school students and understanding the role they play in the world they live in. She comes to the organization with a master's in education and environmental education from Western Washington University, including a year long residency with, oh, give me one second here. Oh, sorry. Including, a, oh no, you're good. Including a residency with North Cascades Institute for the past three years. She's been responsible for all middle and high school environmental education for the Sustainable Schools Program, including the YEP, Youth for Environmental, Youth for the Environment and People Program. Mm -hmm. From teaching hands on marine science lessons to sixth graders, abroad the snow goose vessel to developing a youth empowerment program for high school students, Sasha brings expertise and a wealth of experience. Through the lens of equity and justice, Sasha hopes to inspire and empower youth to protect and promote the health of local eco ecosystems and communities. When not in the office, she can be found pedaling around town, strolling amidst the forest, scribbling in her journal and stretching into a yoga pose. 
All right, thank you, Sasha, for joining us today, and I will go ahead and pass it off to you. All right, thank you very much, Destiny, and thank you, everyone, for showing up today on a beautiful afternoon. Um, yeah, we're gonna just jump right in. I would say we have a really small group, and so if you all have questions or thoughts, ideas, something it reminds you of while we're, I'm doing the presentation, please just unmute yourself and shout them out. Um, there, I do leave time at the end for questions, but um, I think sometimes being able to, to ask your questions as we're moving along is a little more effective because I always forget by the end <laughs> if I have a question. So feel free to unmute yourself and, and shout it out. I'm used to teaching middle and high school students. Um, so there's a lot of interaction always going on in workshops. So I'm used to it. So feel free to, you know, empower your inner child <laughs> with curiosity. And so, whoops. Okay. So before we go any further, I do want to acknowledge that um, we are on the ancestral, the tra traditional and contemporary lands of the Lummi Nation, the Nooksack tribe and other Coast Salish peoples. Um, these folks have been here since time immemorial or before, before memory, um, upwards of 15,000 years. They've lived in, or they continue to live in relationship with the land in a way that I think non-natives are just beginning to really understand. And so um, I also want to acknowledge that an acknowledgement is, is just that. It is a, a small first step. And so um, it's important to also support and uplift indigenous voices, um, the treaties that we all signed, um, just support in any way you can. If you can listen, if you can attend events, um, I was able to go see the canoe journey before COVID um, in 2019. And so it's really, they're very gracious in their um, inviting, I think, of non-native folks to some, some of their events and um, activities. And so I encourage you all to, if you don't know too much about the tribes in this area, you know, go ahead and do a little research and um, reach out and, and kind of get you know, get familiar with, with folks and um, begin to support them in the ways that they can continue their, their way of being. So a little bit about me, Destiny just explained most of it. Um, also, I was gonna have you all put your name in the chat box, but you don't necessarily need to do that because you were able to share with your own voices. Um, this is just a picture of me when I was we, and it's kind of the first place where I fell in love <clears throat> excuse me, fell in love with the natural world, so to speak, for just the world in general. Um, it's our backyard. I used to collect fireflies and jars, which I know is mean, but I would let them free. And then I would collect frogs in my little kiddie pool. And I just explored the garden area. You know, when you're so small, it felt so big. Um, honestly, nothing has really changed. I still love to be outside and explore and just be. And so, yeah, so I got my master's in environmental education and I just hope to um, help teachers and students learn about, you know, the climate crisis and climate justice and ways, because I think learning a little bit more about it, um, then you can move forward and, and come up with creative solutions and take action and feel empowered rather than just bombarded by all of this like kind of depressing news. <laughs> so, that's, that's me in a nutshell, basically. And I'm just going to start kind of broad, big picture, huge earth. We have 7.8 billion people. Of course, that's changing every second of every day. But a statistic that always strikes me is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the population of the United States is only 5% of the world population, yet we use roughly 25% of the world's natural resources. I will say I'm an educator and I'm not a scientist. So some of these statistics, they're um, about close to, you know, it's not exactly 5%, nor is it exactly 25%. But um, so, you know, what happens to the other 95% of the world's population? And then what happens to all of the natural resources, right? It's like, how can we begin to live a little bit softer on the planet? And so that's kind of where 
you know, the background of this um, presentation and, and the, you know, kind of analyzing why we buy so much stuff and where our stuff comes from and what happens to it when we're done with it. And so just kind of, um, you know, how can we maybe do better? Oops. All right. And so I'm just going to show this little video. Um, it is called Life of a Spoon. It is made, created by Greenpeace. Uh, it's less than two minutes. And I like to show my students this, but it just kind of goes into the life cycle of a spoon, which will, uh, that's where we're headed today to talk a little bit more about the life cycle of stuff and how we can find solutions to some of the problems. 4.5 billion years ago, a giant molecular cloud collapses in space, setting free a solar nebula out of which a planet is born, Earth. For 2 billion years, this planet evolves and first life appears. A soup of cells, bacteria, algae, fungi, a myriad of plants come to life. Fish rain the oceans and eat the algae. They absorb the sunlight and store it in their bodies. Dinosaurs, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, they all live and die. And each year, the dead bodies are covered by layers and layers of sediment. Heat and pressure rise, turning them into yellow-black liquid, oil. Humans arrive, and with them, geologists. They study for years to find the oil and build rigs in remote places. Giant pumps extract the liquid, and it's shipped across the oceans. A refinery now cracks it open, and once again, it travels. A factory then binds the compounds and turns them into plastic pellets, stored in big containers around the world they go liquefied. They're molded into the shape of a beautiful spoon. The spoon drops and cools off to harden. Wrapped in plastic, it is put into a box, and the box is put on a pallet, and the pallet is put into a container, and the container is put on a truck, and the truck drives to a port, where the container is put on a ship, and ship, 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 the spoon arrives 6,000 kilometers around the world, where it is picked up by a merchant who puts it on a truck and drives it to a store, where it's placed on a shelf in a temperature-controlled room, where it sits for two months until you select it and pay for it with the money you've worked hard for and you drive the spoon home, which is where you are standing right now with the spoon in your hand. Now tell me, do you still think it's too much effort to use a metal spoon that you just have to wash? <laughs> Thanks for watching that. Anyone have any um, initial reactions to that at all? All right, so um, this gets us to the life cycle of a product. And, and I'm kind of going through this because um, all of these steps along the way are also leverage points or places where we can insert ourselves um, to create some sort of solution or a different pathway. And so thinking about your skill set, your passions, your job, um, what you have access to, and, and, and think about maybe somewhere along this life cycle um, or maybe closing the loop in a different way. Um, there's lots of entry points. And so that also means that there's lots of uh, potential solutions and, and actions and things that we can take to um, reduce the impact on the, on the earth and, and communities as well. So I'd like to do a little activity um, using something called Jamboard. It's really easy. I am not um, super techie, so uh, I wouldn't put anything on here that's too complicated. So um, Destiny, if you don't mind dropping the link to the Jamboard in the chat, and then when you all click on that, um, you will come to something that looks like this, life cycle of stuff. And I'm just gonna quickly go over Jamboard in case um, folks are not familiar with it. It's very easy. You'll see some icons here on the left and the, very, the only one you need to worry about is the one in the middle. Um, if you scroll over it, it'll say sticky note. And all you do is click it, the sticky note icon comes up, you pick your favorite color, do whatever you want. Um, oops. And then you'll click, write your note, and then um, you just click save and then cancel. You'll notice that it will probably pop up up here, like 
oh, I'm right over the um, instructions. But all you have to do is just click on the sticky note and drop it, move it wherever you want. You can make it big, you can make it small. Um, it's quite simple. If you are like, I want to delete it, you just click the um, three little dots at the top right and then hit delete and it's gone. And so that's basically how you do that. Um, I'll move into what I'm asking you to do. So you're gonna choose something in your space. It could be what, something above you, in front of you, something you're sitting on, something you're eating, something you're drinking, you're looking through. Um, choose an item and then think about what raw materials were used in making the item. Think about is the item or any part of the item, is it recyclable or potentially reusable? And then think about how long you might use the item or, or what's the lifespan of the item. For example, like the spoon, of course you could reuse that over and over and over, but it was made basically as a single use item. So I'd like to just give you all a couple minutes to engage in this activity. And does anyone have questions? You can just unmute yourself or drop your question in the chat. No questions? All right, yeah, I'll give you like two, two to three minutes. If you all are still working after that, I can leave, give you more time. Give you all another minute or so. These are great. Thanks for sharing. Great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, this was just to get you all to think a little bit about, you know, where our stuff comes from. Feel free to keep working on that if you would like.
any thoughts, noticings, or reactions, whether it was your item or somebody else's, or maybe you've never thought about this before, maybe you think about it all the time. I'll pop in real quick. I have a tendency to think about um, where my where my stuff comes from, if it's food or if it's clothes, but I've never looked at like my condiment package or my glass bottle or something and thought about the energy that also took to make it. Cause I went a little bit long in my answer and then I deleted a bunch of it. But, you know, you think about the energy it requires to make glass. Yeah, it can be super easily recycled, but it's still really um, energy intensive. I'm gonna do this for everything in my house probably for the rest of the week. <laughs> Great, thank you, Amanda, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, I, yeah, I'm also like kind of obsessed with LCAs. I used to teach this to like sustainability students um, back in grad school. So it's constantly on my mind. So I have to like actively not think about it so I can like find peace. But um, I was just pleased to notice that my Frisbee that I have here was made in the USA. So I at least feel slightly better about that, uh, but it's still a giant hunk of plastic, so. Great, thank you, Liz, thanks for sharing. And thanks for thinking about it. I mean, I have to be honest that, I mean, I always have cared about, you know, environmental issues and things for my whole life, but before this job, some of the things I'm gonna talk about today, I really had not thought about, partly because I had never really taught, no one had ever spent time teaching it to me, but um, yeah, it's pretty interesting to, yeah, just think about like, God, everything, everything is, is, is from the earth in some, in some form and the energy it takes to produce it. And there's just so much involved. So great. Anyone else? So I'm going to pick on cell phones just for a minute because every, most people have them. Um, thinking about the, you know, what it's made from. Again, I'm not, I don't know exactly all the specific metals and minerals. And, and if, if anybody wants to share your knowledge, feel free to pop in. Um, but cell phones, right, they're mostly made from metals and, and minerals mined from the earth, plastics, which are made from fossil fuels, and then of course, a small amount of glass, and that's made from sand. And so these are images of some mines, um, one in Chile and one in Indonesia. So thinking about I always feel like these images are so powerful. Um, I was, I know that things are extracted from the earth, but some of these bigger mines are just, I mean, they're just huge scars on the land. And you think about the people that work there, the communities that are surrounded in that area that depend on clean air and clean water and probably don't have it because of these mines. Um, and just the vast scarring, you know, of the ecosystem and, and all of the impacts it has. Um, and I, yeah, recently, or the, within the past year, I have gotten another cell phone and it was just the most agonizing thing for me. Cause it's like, ugh, you know, I feel like I'm adding to this. And, um, again, this, this presentation isn't meant to make anyone feel bad. We're, we're, um, human beings and we need things, but just that, I think some people have that mindless consumption. And so just thinking about, wow, where does it actually come from? And what does it look like and how does it impact the communities and the landscape? Um, same with sand. I think about sand as far as, you know, beaches are disappearing from sea level rise and climate change and um, just population growth in cities. So thinking about, wow, we're taking sand off of beaches. What does that do to the communities nearby? Um, yeah, just something to think about. And then, of course, packaging. I'm sure you all are very well versed in um, the issues surrounding packaging. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a little bit about the fun solutions that are happening or not fun, but I think great solutions that are starting to happen, at least in our, our state. But it's just so interesting to me that plastics, not all plastics are bad, right? Um, a lot of the medical use, medical industry uses plastics in a, you know, in a great way. But it's interesting to me that we chose to use a very durable, long lasting, sort of forever material for single use. I don't know how that ever really got started. To me, it makes no sense that, 
you know, we're using the, that durable material for one single use. So again, all of our stuff comes in something and a lot of times it's in plastic, which of course you all know, cause you've probably done many beach cleanups. It's mostly plastic, right? Along the beaches, um, you know, we try to do our best and recycle what we can, but the truth is our recycling goes to developing nations. They don't, it doesn't necessarily go, it doesn't stay within our own country. And so some of these nations don't necessarily have the infrastructure or capacity to deal with all of the developed nations um, plastic waste. And you all are probably most familiar with the, the ocean garbage patches as well. Um, patches is a funny word because I think of patches just patching a small hole. Um, they're, they're ginormous, um, size of Texas and they're on, you know, the plastics are on the surface, they're in the middle, they're sinking to the bottom, they're breaking down. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a mess. And then kind of switching to um, fast fashion because that is also impacts hugely communities and the environment and ecosystems and, and just sort of, it's something that um, a lot of companies are kind of pushing. And h and I'm just picking on them. There are plenty of others that, you know, Zara and Gap and, and anybody, most of those um, companies are uh, making clothes, fast fashion being, you know, it's not made to last. Um, trends change quickly. And so it's kind of just meant to be worn a couple times and then discarded. And so usually I ask students, is, is this a fair price? Why or why not? You know, when we get in discussions about it, um, of course it's three bucks. Your initial thought is like, wow, awesome. And then it's like, well, let's dig a little deeper. What does that mean? And so um, second to the oil industry, the clothing and textile industry is the largest polluter in the world. And that statistic always kind of stands out to me as well. And we're humans, we need clothing, but wow, do we need three closets full? You know, it's just something to think about. Sasha, I'm gonna jump in really quick. We have a question from Maggie. She yeah. says, I'm interested to hear about the state of plastic recycling, how much gets reused and with what environmental processing cost? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's tricky and it depends on the county where you live, the city, the state. It is, is not across the board the same answer for every location. We recently, um, well, Parberries or Northwest Recycling used to take our, um, sort our recycling and take it to, um, for example, our, our glass would go down to Seattle and our aluminum goes to, um, it's somewhere in the south and it gets made into cans. And plastics, while most of the country, the, when China said, no, we're not taking your plastics anymore, uh, most of the country, their plastics were going into the landfill. Here in Whatcom County, um, the market was found in mostly Indonesia is where the plastics, our plastics from Whatcom County were going. So you think about, okay, the resources that it takes to get there. And then if, if some of the, you know, maybe there's places in Europe, like some were also shipping to Indonesia. And so these small communities were getting inundated with plastics. And so not every type of plastic is recyclable just because it's plastic doesn't mean it's um, recyclable. It, despite the fact that it has the chasing arrows and the numbers and, um, people kind of wish cycling the plastics. And so um, basically it seemed like numbers one and two were actually going to getting recycled and going to, but they were going to Indonesia. And so um, people put a lot of different types of plastics in their recycling bins, right? Cause there's just not a ton of education around it. And so a lot of that, a lot of the plastics just end up in a landfill or they get burned in a you know developing nation, incinerated, um, just kind of pushed to the side. And so it's kind of, you know, I, I feel like I feel like recycling is just not really the answer for plastics. Um, I know that there is a there's a 
I believe it's a nonprofit. I'm not sure if it's a nonprofit or not, but it's called Ridwell and they're out of Seattle and they're trying to move into Washington, into um, Bellingham. And they're taking things that are a little more um, hard to recycle, like the bags. Um, and they just have set different items that aren't necessarily recyclable in, in our bins that we have at, at Whatcom County. It does cost a certain amount of money and they only come certain, um, certain days, I think. I'm still kind of trying to research because they're kind of just piloting it here right now and they don't, you know, I don't know exactly how it's gonna work. But I don't know if that answered your question, but really most plastics are not really getting recycled. Ours are still, um, you know, some of it is like, like numbers one and two generally are. And then, but again, it, they're taken to Indonesia. And so to me, that's, you know, they're just getting inundated with our plastic waste. And a lot of it ends up in the ocean or um, incinerated, which is not good for the communities in the area. Did that answer your question a little bit or feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask? Yeah, I mean, I realize that there's tons of questions about it and that's interesting that Whatcom County is still a little bit ahead of the game compared yeah. to everywhere else, but I'm, I'm understanding your main point is to use less of it. So, yeah, uh, and it's, it's just that there aren't markets. Like it's still cheaper to make a brand new water bottle or a bottle of water or something um, from the raw materials than it is to use recycled materials. So and still, until that like balance slips, um, I think that's just going to be, that's, that's one of the big problems. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, back just to the t-shirt, um, you know, what are the environmental and social impacts of the life cycle of a t-shirt? Many of you probably know this. So if it is made with cotton, or if it's made with bamboo or um, hemp or something like that, it's a natural product. Um, it's gonna have a different life cycle than if it's made with like a synthetic material. Synthetic material is basically just plastic. So it's gonna have a little bit of a different life cycle, but it, will, it still impacts in, in very huge ways. Um, cotton is a very water intensive plant. It's often grown in areas that don't receive a lot of rainfall. So just thinking about all the uh, resources that go into making this t-shirt. So there's a lot of water involved. Um, oftentimes it is grown in nations that maybe don't have strict regulations on pesticide use or fertilizer use. I certainly wouldn't want this job um, with these folks that don't even have masks on their face spraying what appears to be um, pesticides. And so, you know, what is the impact to, to the people, the workers? And again, right, you all are probably very familiar with the impacts of pesticides in the soil, how it degrades the soil, and how it washes into a, into a water, um, a waterway, generally a creek of some sort or river, or eventually out into the ocean. And so it's pretty problematic. And then of course, um, if you're, if the t-shirt is $3, it's not made in this country, because you can't, possibly pay someone a living wage um, and, 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 um, and have it be $3 to make a profit. So again, a lot of the um, garments are made in um, developing nations that may not have very strict regulations or you know, the corporation just has so much power that they just get away with it anyway. Um, so a lot, you know, cotton's white. So like I'm wearing a red shirt, right? That's some sort of dye or chemical. Um, and so, in that process, a lot of times the waste is just dumped out into the environment, which of course impacts um, communities living in the area and, and obviously the environment as well, waterways and, and potentially the air pollution as well. Um, pretty much covered that. And then of course, the, you know, how, are, how are the workers treated? Do they receive a um, livable wage? What are their working conditions? Again, if a t-shirt's three dollars, it's it's they're not making a livable wage. Um, working conditions are they're cramped, their robotic movements, um, they potentially are dangerous. They don't, um, especially obviously during a pandemic, as we saw, they didn't get to work from home. Um, I doubt the factories closed down. They might have, but again, you know, each one is could be potentially different. Not every 
factor is, is the same, but um, overall it's, it's thinking about, you know, how are these folks treated and, you know, they don't have insurance, they don't have benefits, they don't have vacation, things like that. And then the big one for me is, you know, on average, on average, again, um, I think probably Whatcom County is lower than this, but people living in the United States literally throw away about 81 pounds of clothing each year. And that's throw away. That's not give away to your neighbor or your sibling or your friend. Um, it's throw away in a landfill. So that's kind of the life cycle of the t-shirt. So there's lots of places to plug in and think about solutions. Uh, but but on that topic of a way, does anyone know where our landfills are? Like, where does our garbage from Whatcom County go? I did not know this before I had this job. So <laughs> does anybody know? It goes about 400 miles um, towards, uh, there's a couple landfills and um, they are on one is in Washington, one is in Oregon along the Columbia River. Um, so we're up here uh, on the top, in the middle there by the star. And then um, our waste goes on a truck and a train and eventually you know, travels down here. So again, thinking about the resources just to get our garbage into a landfill. And these are the two landfills. I don't have a ton of time to get into um, the impacts of landfills. You could probably guess what a lot of them are, um, but these are rather large. So there's one called Columbia Ridge Landfill and that's in Arlington. And then there's one on the Washington side of the river and it's Roosevelt Landfill. Um, you can see the heavy machinery that's pushing the garbage around. You can see a truck spraying water so that um, the dust doesn't doesn't um, stir up and it you can tell by the wind turbines that it's a windy place right um, and so there's actually at least at the Columbia Ridge landfill you can see the fencing around there it's actually someone's job um, to go and collect all the like plastic bags that collect around there um, just due to the wind uh, and so it's just kind of interesting to think about placement of landfills, who wants to live near a landfill. Um, yeah, and they eventually fill up. And so then we have to figure out where else, you know, where are we going to put the next one? And one of the issues um, is that things break down or decompose a lot slower in a landfill because there's just trash going on top of it, on top of it, on top of it. And so their um, organic matter is decomposing anaerobically without oxygen. So things like food waste or yard waste um, or lumber, things like that are producing methane when they are decomposing in a landfill as opposed to a composting system like an industrial compost, like the Green Earth Technology up in Linden. Um, obviously they're making sure there's air turning around in the, in the piles and um, there's heat and they're monitoring things and, and the microorganisms and bacteria, the things that are not bacteria, but the decomposers are breaking down the material um, in a way that produces beautiful soil, right? In a landfill, it's just not that, not that way. It's just it's, um, more trash just piles on top and then um, air can't get in and things uh, decompose slowly. If it's organic, it's decomposing um, anaerobically, which is, producing methane into the air, which is a greenhouse gas, which you probably know. These are just some, um, how long it takes some items to, to decompose in a landfill. Um, again, it, this is not science right here. This is, it depends where that aluminum can is. Is it at the top of the pile? Is it at the bottom? This is sort of an average, um, but I always like to show it to students too and, and ask them, well, I don't tell them, I have them guess. But anyway, I just think it's really interesting how long things take to decompose in a landfill as opposed to if it was just out in the air um, or whether, or if it was um, being composted. So that's one, of the, that's one of the bigger things, I think is the issues with landfills. Is stuff just sticks around for a really long time. And then of course, you know, as Americans, we, we buy so much stuff, but are we really that happy? Um, I don't really know, but, um, 
I always ask the students too, like, why do we buy so much stuff? Like, why, why, what are the, you know, what's making us do this? And some of the answers, you know, peer pressure, we think it'll make us happy. Maybe we're trying to oppress somebody or others. We impulse buy, you know, retail therapy, advertising. There's a lot of pressure, um, especially with, I would say, advertising and marketing and, and just kind of pressure on us to feel like, okay, I need to buy more stuff. It'll make me happier. And um, it, it doesn't, it might make you happy for a minute, but <laughs> not in the long run. And then perceived obsolescence. I think, again, like I said, I bought a new um, cell phone last year. So sometimes you believe that you need to update something, even though the old model still works fine. And um, whether it's your phone, some sort of device, it could be a car, it could be could be the the crackers or the cookies you know there's more chocolate chips this is crispier um it's just that marketing and, and advertising sometimes just gets you know it's it's on every website we're looking at if we're just bombarded and then of course the planned obsolescence where i think this is a great place for us to insert ourselves um when a product is deliberately designed to have a shorter lifespan, like if you've ever gone to Goodwill or something and bought a, um, say like a vacuum cleaner or blender or something from the fifties, A, it doesn't have that much plastic in it and B, it's still around, it still works. Uh, if I go to Walmart and buy the, the cheapest vacuum, um, it's probably gonna break down in, in less than a year or you know maybe two, but um, the bottom line is, is, is companies want to make money. And so it's like, I don't want to make a product that's going to last or that is repairable. Um, I'm just going to keep selling more stuff. Okay, so that was like more of the doom and gloom and stuff you, you might know a lot of that. Um, but I, this is sort of where we get to like the fun part and the solutions and what can we do. And these are some R's that used to kind of just be more, you know, Re reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, and again, recycling is great, but I also think it's more of a band-aid. It's, you know, if the, if your tub is overflowing with water and you're scooping it out um, with a bucket, instead of turning off the faucet, you know, it's just the faucet would be a lot more impactful. So um, I don't mean to diss recycling. It's very important, but I think if people just blindly consume thinking I recycle, it's okay. Well, you're still extracting all of those materials. And as we're learning, especially with plastics that things aren't actually getting recycled as much as we hope <laughs> um, because there isn't a market. Um, so here's all the R's we'll kind of go through, but I encourage you all to like really rethink. I always tell students if, you know, the way we do things now is not the way we always have, nor is it, a, you know, the way we need to do it in the future. So of course we can buy less. That's the best one, right? I mean, it's tricky, easier said than done. Buy local or make it yourself. Um, there's a great, you might be aware of this, but there's a buy nothing group on, I know it's on Facebook. It might be on other social media platforms as well, but it's, there's not even a barter situation. It's just like, I have a lamp. Does anybody want it? It's for free, come pick it up. And it sort of encourages you also when you have something you want to get rid of, you know, to also like kind of pay it forward instead of trying to make 10 bucks off of a lamp or something um, or giving it to Goodwill, you can keep it in the neighborhood. And so it keeps obviously things out of the landfill and it keeps folks from like buying more stuff really, um, just kind of extending the life of something. And then Bellingham Makerspace is really cool. Um, I don't know a ton about it, but it's it's a, a space where uh, people can rent. It's not free, but you can rent um, a space and there's tools and there's things to help if you're like, I really wanna learn how to make X, Y, Z. Um, a lot of times you can go and, and sort of rent the space, rent the tools and make something. And so rather than buying, you know, maybe you can get some materials at the restore and then, you know, make something new instead of buying something. Um, the repair broken items, this is a big one right now. Um, this, unfortunately, in Washington, uh, House Bill 1212 uh, tried to get um, passed this year and it didn't, it didn't happen. Um, just means it'll be back next year. 
And most of the right to repair uh, work that's being done right now is around digital devices or electronics. Um, I believe there's about, mm, I think there's 21 states that sort of are working on a right to repair um, legislation so that companies have to either make their manual accessible so that people can learn how to repair the item or you know if you know how to fix things maybe you can open up a shop and and learn and um, people can come get their devices repaired rather than having all of this um all of the the devices just kind of ending up in landfills some of the things in cell phones are recyclable but again nine times out of ten it's going to a developing nation where people are ripping apart this sort of toxic thing and or item and then um, just pulling out a part here and there that they can use and, and make money on or recycle or whatever. Um, and then the rest just gets thrown away. Um, so repairing again is a great way of reusing, right? Um, this is just another article if people want to read a little bit deeper. Um, Destiny, if you don't mind dropping it in the chat, you might have already actually. Um, so yeah, again, there's a big push right now. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission's trying to get this, um, they're really behind it. And, and there's lobbyists saying that, oh, it's dangerous if, if people fix their stuff, which um, the Federal Trade Commission is saying no. And so there's, this is an article if you wanna read a little bit more about it. Um, you can buy secondhand, of course, reuse, upcycle, these are all the lovely places in Bellingham that, and this is not an exhaustive list, there's plenty more. Um, so whether you can drop things off at like Rag Finery, um, even if your shirt has a hole in it, you know, they might take it and then someone can use it in a, in a sewing project. Um, they also have sewing classes, so sort of empowering people to, to, to make things on their own or to fix things or yeah, just get creative with your um, garments. Of course, the ReStore, everyone loves the ReStore. Um, backcountry Essentials is uh, more of just backcountry gear. Um, they have new and used and the rest are kind of closed. And then the hub is a great place to, um, if you have an old bike you don't want anymore, you can drop that off um, and they repurpose it, make a new bike and sell it. Buy quality products, of course. Um, these are some great, we have a lot of amazing artists in this town that, and again, this is not exhaustive at all. There's plenty of folks that I did not put on here um, that make really interesting things, um, whether it's uh, repurposing something like the sewn designs. Um, she does, she repur repurposes leather and makes um, earrings and wallets and things like that. Um, spin cycle yarn, spin their own yarn, and they use natural dyes and um, just very cool stuff. Intertwined designs, textiles by Heather is bags. Um, and a lot of times they're using repurposed textiles also or garments that have been used before. So thinking about ways we can support each other and um, elevate our artists and um, yeah, come to creative solutions. Of course, pay attention to packaging. Um, this is the one um, you are probably, you all are probably familiar with this, but the Senate bill five, um, 5022 that the governor signed yesterday, um, it's gonna reduce plastic pollution. And so certain items are banned, styrofoam in particular, it's requiring that customers ask for the plastic ware, that plastic spoon, that, you know, they're still able to hand that out, but they're not just gonna hand it out with every um, to-go order for restaurants. Um, so again, thinking about, you know, you can, what are the ways that we can come up with creative solutions as a community? And um, we, I'm I feel very lucky and blessed to live in Washington state. I think, um, you know, while a lot of these bills, they're not perfect, but they, they certainly are a great place to start. Um, and so, yeah, I think we, our politicians are pretty progressive in that way. So also research and hold companies accountable for just and sustainable practices. You know, um, you all might be familiar with this, but there are, 
and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but there are a lot of companies and corporations that are really trying to do um, uh, make their products in a sustainable way. They're going to give back to communities. They're going to give back to the environment. Um, they're beginning to repair gear. If your tent pole breaks, send it back, and they'll generally fix it for three for free. Potentially, maybe there's a small fee, but um, there's really a push to repair things and reuse. Um, the Koyuchi, I think, I don't know exactly how you say that. If you, they basically sell um, linens and, you know, curtains and bed bedding sheets, things like that. Uh, they have a take back program where if you send your old linens and stuff back that you bought from them, they'll give you a discount on um, a new, new set of sheets or whatever. So, and they use uh, organic cotton, things like that as well. So there are a lot of uh, companies and corporations that are making headway. And um, again, thinking about if you're able to support, I know a lot of these uh, garments or gear, what, whatever it might be, are a little bit more expensive because it's, it's like a true cost of an item. Um, and that's not accessible to everyone. And I absolutely understand that. Um, that's, an, that's another subject, right? Um, there's systems in place that are creating that as well. So if you're able, there's ways, you know, to, to put your uh, money towards companies that are kind of quote unquote doing the right thing. All right, um, this is where you all get to interact. So we're gonna do another quick uh, Jamboard and thinking about um, what are your ideas? How can we reshape patterns of spending at a local level or state level? Um, thinking about, uh, I, I always, yeah, it's just, I think it's important to think about where we can plug in um, in thinking about solutions. Like, what are your skill sets? What are your passions? Uh, do you, um, do you want to run for office? Do you want to um, design a website to help artists sell their things better? Um, do you want to get into the recycling business? Do you want, I mean, there's all these, these, all these ways in this whole life cycle process um, where I feel like we can plug in as a community and really, and make a difference. I mean, these things aren't going to happen overnight, but you have to come up with the ideas first. Um, and so it's the same thing, Jamboard. Um, I think the link is in the, thank you, Destiny, for dropping the links in there. Um, so you can just use a sticky note and and write maybe what some ideas that you have or uh, something. I mean, I, there's plenty of things that are happening that I did not mention today. So maybe you're like, oh, this cool thing is going on. Um, you could share that with folks. Um, and we, it's like 4.53. So I want to also leave time for questions, but this is kind of the last activity. This is sort of the end and then we'll have time for questions. So I'm gonna give you all a couple minutes just to spend time on this and then if people have other questions. And feel free if you're confused by what I'm asking you to do, feel free to shout out. Yeah, the fix and repair stuff is pretty big and hopefully hopefully that bill will come back next year. Yeah, and incentivizing grocers to bring in products that are hyper local. That's great. Libraries. Perfect. Lending libraries. I love that. That's great. Truth and labeling. That's a good one. Yeah. 
Yes, plant, plant parent friends. Yes, think about where your plants come from. And what you're planting. I always think about that. There's so many beautiful non-native plants that it's tempting to put them in the ground. And it's like, well. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, great. So great ideas. Yeah, cultural shift, not have the newest and the latest. Durable is better. Yep, those are my. Put the expense on the company. I like that too. Bellingham ordinances. Yep. It's okay. It's okay to say no to your friends who are asking you to buy their pampered chef stuff. <laughs> That's great. Please keep adding your um, comments or ideas or thoughts on this. Um, I'm gonna stop share. Well, yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing actually. So that if folks have questions that I might be able to um, answer or comments. <laughs> I just like to share this fact that I got from a Zero Waste Washington presentation that for every year you hold on to your phone it's the equivalent of taking 16,000 cars off the road because that's what like the footprint of your cell phone is, which I just thought was like so wild and made me feel so much better about holding on to my phone well beyond its expected life. Yeah. Wow. That's a powerful statistic. Yeah. I have several questions, but I want to give folks a chance uh, who do not work with Sasha to ask any questions. So do we have any more questions? Otherwise, I will jump in. I'll ask one. So I love cheap clothes. I don't love fast fashion. So I will usually like buy all of my clothes from Goodwill or secondhand stores. But I've heard that giving not just clothes, but things to Goodwill isn't always the best Wait, and I don't know if it's like specifically Goodwill. I don't know what happens to the stuff that they don't sell, but do you know what happens to the stuff that Goodwill doesn't sell? And is there a better way to get rid of items that we don't want? Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not 100% sure. I've seen some articles. I know some of it will get, you know, maybe they, a lot of it will get shipped to other countries, whether it's developing nations or whatever. Um, Cause it's kind of like, we don't want it. It won't sell or, you know, people get rid of all kinds of stuff. And so, um, you know, it may not, it may have lots of holes in it or be broken or whatever. Um, so yeah, and a lot of it will get shipped to other countries and then some of it does end up in the landfill. It's not, um, I would say, I mean, I definitely give stuff good to goodwill. Um, but I think too, so, you know, thinking about that buy nothing group, uh, I know it's on, I don't know what else it's on. I know it's on Facebook, but you can find your little neighborhood and it's amazing the stuff that people give away. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I would, I know, and Rag Finery might get mad at me for saying this I, because I know they can only take so much, but they, Rag Finery will take your garments potentially. I don't know where they are right now and how full they are, especially just after or kind of post pandemic lockdown at least um but they they will take things too and that will for sure get used by community members to make other things or they have artists that come in and, and make other garments or quilts and things like that and sell it as well does so, anyone know about sorry no go does ahead anyone know about value village versus goodwill like i've heard some things about value village being actually a for-profit um, but I don't know where their profits go or does anyone know anything about that? I don't. So I've 
seen, I think like on their sign, when you walk in, it says that they are not a nonprofit, that they are for profit. And I think they also, it's not just stuff that's donated. I think they also get surplus inventory from places that I don't know, but that would be, that would be good to look up because I love Value Village and I should probably know that if I shop there. <laughs> That's a question I've been meaning to like dig into for like a very long time and I just haven't like remembered, so. Well, yeah, should we give our stuff to Value Village or Goodwill or what, yeah. yeah. That would be good. Are there any more questions or comments? Well, thank you for good orientation and incentive to keep making efforts. Yeah, thank you all for showing up today and um, being engaged and willing to do activities and things. Um, I appreciate your attention. Yeah. And you can always reach out if you have any other questions. Yeah, absolutely. You can find Sasha's info on our, I should have put it in the chat. You can find Sasha's info on our resources website. But yes, thank you all for attending. And this presentation is recorded. So if this is a lot of information thrown at you and you want to go back and take a look at some of the tips, I know I will, then that'll be up on our resources YouTube page um, within the next day or so. But yes, thank you all so much for joining us. And this is actually going to be the last um, North Sound Steward speaker series for a while. We're going to take a break. Um, as monitoring starts picking up. So, um, but you will hear from us in the next couple of months when we start bringing it back. But yes, thank you all for joining us and I hope you enjoy the sunshine and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.